Your passcode has been confirmed. If you Welcome, and thank you for standing by. All participants are placed on listen only until the question and answer session for today's conference call. Today's call is being recorded, and if you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I'm Loretta Jackson Brown, and I'm representing the Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity, COCA, with the Division of Strategic National Stockpile at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We are delighted to welcome you to today's COCA webinar, the Raw Milk Movement. COCA is excited to offer this special call series with our COCA partner, the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. We are pleased to have with us today Dr. Joni Scheffel and Dr. Michelle J. Russell. At the conclusion of today's session, the participant will be able to state social drivers behind the increasing demand for raw milk and raw milk products in the U.S., describe how raw milk is regulated in the U.S., describe common enteric pathogens transmitted through raw milk consumption and the associated sequelae, and discuss the risk raw milk consumption poses to children. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all planners, presenters, and their spouses, partners, must disclose any financial or other association with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of an unlabeled product or product under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses, partners, wish to, wish to disclose they have no financial interest or other relationship with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. Planners have reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. This presentation will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or product under investigational use. Continuing education is available for today's activity and instructions on how to obtain credit will be given at the end of today's session. At the end of this presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask the presenters questions. On the phone, pressing star six will unmute your phone. You may su submit questions through the webinar system at any time during the presentation by selecting the Q&A tab at the top of the webinar screen and typing in your question. This will place your question into the queue. Our first presenter is Dr. Joni Shefto. Dr. Shefto is a state public health veterinarian with and supervisor of the Zoonotic Disease Unit at the Minnesota Department of Health. She is responsible for zoonotic disease surveillance and zoonotic disease outbreak investigations. This has included surveillance for raw milk-associated enteric illness, investigation of outbreak associated with raw milk consumption, and testimony for county prosecutors in raw milk legal cases. Our second presenter is Dr. Michelle J. Russell. Dr. J. Russell is a research microbiologist and manager for the Western Center for Food Safety at the University of California, Davis. A diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine, Dr. J. Russell has expertise in the investigation, surveillance, prevention, and control of zoonotic diseases, animal-related injuries, and foodborne pathogens. She is co-founder and working group leader for Real Raw Milk Facts, a clearinghouse for evidence-based studies, presentations, commentaries, regulations, and position statements on raw milk. At this time, please welcome Dr. Shastel. Hello, everybody. Dr. J. Russell and I are so happy to be here today to talk about the raw milk movement. Raw milk is a topic that we are both passionate about because it is an important public health issue, but it also sits at the intersection of science and politics and gets at the heart of the role of government in our society. The science 
behind the ra- behind the raw milk issue is pretty straightforward. It's a well established source of human illness. Generally, we think of enteric enteric pathogens like Campylobacter, Salmonella, E. coli O157, and the other Shiga toxin producing E. coli, Cryptosporidia. But you can also get um, you know systemic infections with organisms that cause Q fever, Listeria, Brucella, tuberculosis. If you're going to look at sort of a generalized picture of the illnesses associated with consuming raw milk, it would be an acute gastroenteritis with fever and diarrhea that can be bloody, abdominal cramps, and vomiting. And um, these things are are serious illnesses, but they're usually self-limiting. What we worry most about are the severe illnesses and complications of these infections that include hemolytic uremic syndrome following infection with the shiga toxin producing E. coli, Guillain-Barre syndrome associated with Campylobacter infection, and certainly um, whenever we're talking about these types of things, we think about the vulnerable populations that are more at risk for serious infection or uh, complications of infection. So we've seen a lot of raw milk outbreaks in Minnesota and have documented them, and and I'm not going to talk about these outbreaks, but I just wanted you, you to see that they occur regularly and they involve um, anywhere from just a few cases to over 100 cases. We had a recent outbreak in 2013 um, involving raw milk soft cheeses made in someone's bathtub, and interestingly, they um, purchased the raw milk semi-legally going to the farm to purchase the milk that I'll talk about in just a little bit, but um, we had a large number of people very ill with uh, salmonella type of Miriam. So in Minnesota, the, the law reads that raw milk may be occasionally secured or purchased for personal use at the farm where the milk is produced. So consumers must go to the farm and purchase the milk directly from the producer. And the interpretation of our law, it's not actually written down, but the interpretation is that they must bring their own container because if the farmer filled it up in advance, that could be construed as being retail. Minnesota is one of around 30 states that do permit raw milk to be sold in some capacity. We have what we call the raw milk loophole in Minnesota, and I understand this does occur in other states as well. Whereas if you're going to, if you want to produce uh, milk for fluid milk sales, you have to be licensed with a grade A license and inspected. If you want to produce milk for cheese production, you have to be licensed with a grade B license and inspected. But but there's no requirement um, to be licensed or inspected to sell raw milk legally as long as you um, require your, your customers to come to the farm to pick up their milk. However, raw milk producers have been skirting the law and setting up illegal distribution routes with drop-off sites in school parking lots and people's garages um, for many years now in Minnesota. And these alternative buying options um, have become quite popular and they're spread through word of mouth, through internet sites and social media. In 2010 in Minnesota, we had a raw milk outbreak that changed the way we think about raw milk. Whereas farm families had traditionally been the primary consumers of raw milk in Minnesota, it became clear that the population of raw milk drinkers was changing and that it wasn't just a food for these consumers, but a statement of their values. Raw milk consumption had become a social movement. This had certainly been going on for a few years, but this outbreak really brought it home for us. In May, um, the last part of May 2010, we identified three cases from different households of E. coli 0157H7 with indistinguishable PFGE subtype patterns. And when we interviewed these cases, raw milk was identified as the likely common vehicle. They had all consumed raw milk from um, a Hartman farm in Gibbon, Minnesota. And so as we do with all, uh, raw, with all milk outbreaks, we, had, we notified the Minnesota Department of Agriculture because they regulate milk in Minnesota. Overall, we ended up with eight confirmed cases of E. coli 0157H7 with onset dates between May 1st and June 1st. 
The median age was 12 years, and five of the eight cases were hospitalized for a median of three days. One case, a, a toddler developed HUS, or hemolytic uremic syndrome. Six of the eight cases had reported exposure to either milk or raw milk cheese from the Hartman Farm. One case, the seventh case, was a sibling, and the eighth case was a student at a school that had served at a drop, as a drop-off site for Hartman Raw Milk. We knew of this situation, and the parents themselves had told us that it was quite likely that their child had drunk raw milk from Hartman Farm at one of their friends' house. So the Hartman Farm is an interesting place. They lost their grade B license in, two, in the year 2000. They're not certified as organic. They're not inspected. Most of their customers would tell you that they are, orga are orga organic, but um, the truth is that they're not. And they had set up one of these illegal drop-off site networks to sell their milk in the suburbs of the Twin Cities. In addition, um, the, the farm produced cheese, yogurt, and ice cream from raw milk, which is completely legal in illegal in Minnesota. It's, it's, as I said, it's legal to sell raw milk from your farm, but it's not legal to make these products without being um, licensed and certified. So on May 26, we did a search of the farm with the Department of Agriculture. Dr. Stacy Holzbauer and I went out there to, um, for the Department of Health, and we, had, <laughs> we were accompanied by nine armed deputies and the county sheriff. All the items made from raw milk were embargoed as uh, there was meat there that was from a custom slaughter meat that was being uh, sold illegally because it wasn't, hadn't been inspected. And um, as a sidebar here, the uh, custom slaughter place that, that supplied the meat for Herman Farms um, was closed down for, for sanitary reasons during this investigation. The chicken and eggs were not embargoed because those were legal sales from the farm. And while we were there, we took 80 environmental and animal samples from a variety of animals and different environments. 26 of those 80 samples were positive for the outbreak strain of E. coli 0157, and you can see that they came from calf pens and calves, heifers, the cow pen, cow pies in the pasture, those would be the milking cows, the steer yard, and from sheep. In addition to the 0157 positive samples, we, there were also 16 samples positive for Cryptosporidium, 12 samples positive for Campylobacter jejuni, and one for Yersinia and Terocolitica. And this would become important later. Um, certainly, we would expect to find Cryptosporidium and Campylobacter on any farm. And this is what the, um, the PFGE subtype patterns looked like. And we found through experience that setting up a picture like this um, is really impactful for helping people understand that um, this genetic fingerprint, you know, was the same between the sick people, animal, and environmental samples. When you visit the farm, the first thing you see is what you would expect to see on an organic farm. You know, a beautiful little lane heading out to where the cows are grazing peacefully. It's certainly, um, I'm sure, what what the um, farm's customers would like to see. However, when you go into the barn, and this is where the cows were milked, with another story. The and these are public um, domain pictures, so it's fine that we're showing them. Um, the um, the cows are are line up in these stanchions here, and um, they're milked there, and there's manure on every surface up to um, beyond your, the height of your head. The gutters are overflowing with manure. And when I first walked in, I looked at the pipeline, which is that little white pipe that, uh, that's on either side of the picture um, above the stanchions, and I thought, oh, they must have abandoned the pipeline because it's so dirty that you couldn't imagine snapping a milker into that pipeline without dragging manure in with it. But it turned out that, yes, they do milk through that, you know, manure-covered pipeline. Here's another picture of the barn with overflowing um, gutters and just manure contamination everywhere, chickens, junk. One interesting aspect of this investigation for me was um, there were some animal welfare issues that 
you wouldn't expect to find um, on a, an organic farm. I think most of the customers believe that the animals are happy and healthy and, um, you know, living wonderful little calf lives. And this was just the end of May, and yet when we went inside these calf hutches to take samples, it was already very, very warm inside that hutch. And generally, there would be a little fence outside the hutch so the calves could get out if they got too warm. Here are the sheep. Again, these, are, these sheep are not loose. You know, they're not free range. These sheep also tested positive for the outbreak strain of 01 plus 7. Here are the pigs. And they're, you know, up to their armpits in manure. And, um, you know, I do know, <laughs> I know at least one customer that thinks that thought that these pigs were healthy, happy, free range pigs because my neighbor used to buy meat from this farm and was quite pleased that she was providing such a happy, wonderful meat for her family. So anyways, what we always do when um, we have an outbreak and we cannot reach everyone who may be at risk, we put out a press release so that people can um, remove any contaminated food from their cupboard if they have it. So we did what we always do. Um, we informed the public that um, well, I'll just read it. The Minnesota Department of Health urges anyone who may have recently purchased milk from the Hartman Dairy Farm, also known as Mom's, to discard the product and not consume it um, because it's contaminated. And then we go on to also warn against um, raw milk products. So um, normally, and this is a question lots of people have, why would we name the farm? Well, that's normal for us, too, because it does the least damage, actually, to, the, to an industry. For example, if there's salmonella in peanut butter, we name the lot number and the date of the contaminated peanut butter so people can go to their cupboards, look, and see if they have that date and lot number and remove it and throw it away if they do. And it doesn't harm other companies who make peanut butter, and it doesn't harm that company more than, you know, just that exact lot number. So um, this, this would be typical for us. The response that we got from the media was not at all typical, however. Um, they, they seem to be balancing the issue. Four Minnesotans, including a toddler, have gotten sick. Such milk is growing in popularity but poses risks. This was the first time we've had this reaction from the Star Tribune and from NPR News um, because typically if we say that there's contaminated you know, peanut butter, people should not eat it, the, the media supports us in that, and they don't say, well, peanut butter is high in protein. This is, there is contaminated peanut butter, but peanut butter is generally good for you and high in protein. That's not the reaction we would normally see from our media. Um, this is the epi curve on this outbreak, and like many raw milk outbreaks, the cases are um, sort of, there's just a few cases here and there, and they're spread out over time. In, in addition to the 0157 cases, we identified three Campylobacter and four Cryptosporidium parvum cases with onset dates actually after the farm was supposed to be not selling any more of their milk until this all got straightened out. Um, the median age of those cases was 14 years, and the human case isolates were indistinguishable from some of the animal samples that we had taken during that May 26 farm, farm inspection. So this outbreak is very interesting and everything, but and it received media attention and it does bring at least the issue to people, you know, to the forefront. However, sporadic cases of illness of any enteric pathogen um, associated with raw milk represent a much larger public health issue than outbreaks do. And just like with the other pathogens that we deal with, only a small minority of cases are associated with recognized outbreaks. So Tricia Robinson, who's a, a great epidemiologist at our health department, put together this paper along with Dr. Kirk Smith and myself. And um, in it, we um, it was published, by the way, last January for 2014. Um, we, our objective was to estimate the burden of human and turk pathogen infections caused by raw milk consumption in Minnesota. And to do that, of course, we need to look at the sporadic cases. So to be included in our study, you had to have a specimen submitted to the Department of Health from 2001 to 2010, you had to be a Minnesota resident, and you had to have a laboratory confirmed infection with Campylobacter, Cryptosporidium, E. coli 0157, or Salmonella. 
to be excluded from our study. You are excluded if you refuse the interview, if you were part of an outbreak, if you traveled internationally, or if you had a case of a species or serotype of one of the um, of Campylobacter cryptosporidium salmonella that was not is not normally associated with raw milk or with cattle contact. And then here's one. Um, every interview was analyzed, and if you if the interview revealed a more likely source of illness than raw milk, the case was excluded from the study. In general, our routine surveillance involves interviewing everybody who gets those organisms. And we interview everybody with this disease-specific standard questionnaire that asks about illness history, asks about different activities, all the food, restaurants, large groups, um, what type of water, whether it's wet, well water or city water, animal contact, any other exposures, including a question about raw milk, when it was consumed, where consumed, and where they got it from. So now on to the results here. Um, during that time period, there were 20,000 Campylobacter, Cryptosporidia, STEC, and Salmonella case reports. And of these, 6,695 um, 6, were excluded. 2,600 reported travel. 1,500 refused the interview. 1,200 were part of an outbreak. And this is the important part here. 273 cases were infected with a species or a serotype that's not generally associated with raw milk or cattle contact. And interestingly, only two of these 273 cases reported raw milk consumption. I'm going to leave this up for a little while. Um, we're going to spend a little time on this slide. So when, after you exclude the cases that were excluded, you're left with 14,339 cases at the bottom of the total cases column. And of those, 530 cases, or 3.7% of the cases, reported raw milk consumption. And you can see that Campylobacter was the most common pathogen reported by people, um, or the most, Campylobacter was the most common infection in people who reported raw milk consumption, followed by Cryptosporidium, E. coli O157, um, Oops, I screwed that up. Salmonella, E. coli 0157, and then the non-0157 STEX. The 11 cases were co-infected with Campylobacter and another pathogen. And for us, that's a clue that raw milk may be a source of infection. And in that time period, there were five raw milk-associated outbreak, outbreaks with 21 cases. There are a median of 54 cases each year of people who report raw milk consumption where raw milk was the most likely source of their infection. And there's a range of 37 to 64 cases a year. And in general, there's been a slight increase in the number of cases. You can see that, again, Campylobacter comprises the largest number, the percentage of the cases that are from raw milk. This is the age distribution of sporadic cases, and you can see that it's very much skewed toward younger cases. 25% of our cases are less than six years of age, and 38% are less than 10 years of age. The E. coli 0157 cases reporting raw milk consumption had a median age of five years, and this compares with the median age of 0157 cases who did not report raw milk consumption of 16 years. And of course, this is really con concerning. 13% of our cases were hospitalized for a median of three days. And among the 19 E. coli 0157 cases, there were four cases of hemolytic uremic syndrome, including a death in an 11-month-old infant. There were 377 cases who were willing to tell us where, you know, where they got their milk. And interestingly, 48% of cases reported getting their milk from their own farm or relative's farm. And um, you can see that also people get milk from friends, at work, neighbors, uh, direct farm sales, drop-off sites, including, um, and then other sites like the schools and the daycare centers make up 18%. T. 
Cases who reported consuming raw milk from their own farm or relative's farm were significantly younger than those who reported obtaining milk from a non-family source. And this was a median age of nine years versus uh, a median age of 19 years for those people who got their raw milk from a non-family source. Among children that were less than five years of age, 17, 76% consumed raw milk from their own dairy farm or a relative's farm. This proportion declined with age among pediatric patients with a steep decline to 9% among those 17 to 20 year old um, raw milk drinkers who more frequently reported obtaining raw milk from their friends or at work. So to wrap this up here, a majority of our cases were infected with Campylobacter, and it's a pretty well known fact that if you drink raw milk, the most likely infection you'll get is Campylobacter. And certainly some of these cases represent, an un represent unrecognized outbreaks because um, of reluctance to divulge a source. And this became more and more the case toward the end of the study, and it's even more, um, we're even finding more now that people are reluctant to tell us where they're getting the raw milk. Another thing we found is that raw milk is an important source of cryptosporidium infections, which I think had been under-recognized in the past. So the number of cases reporting raw milk consumption is increasing as the movement to relax raw milk regulations is gaining momentum. Children are disproportionately affected. Half of our E. coli 0157 cases were less than five years of age. This is concerning because of an increased risk of hemolytic ure uremic syndrome. And our study found that farm family members, particularly young children who drink raw milk, do get sick from it. The difference in disease risk by age group may be a result of acquired immunity among farm family members who were exposed during early childhood. Other studies looking at risk factors for infections with enteric pathogens have also found that by around age five, many farm kids have been exposed and developed immunity to many pathogens normally found on farms. So, <laughs> so you know, it's very common to hear, well, I drank raw milk my whole life and I was never sick. It's quite possible that, these, that um, farm family members were sick before the age where they could remember um, being sick. Sporadic cases of illness associated with raw milk far outnumber cases associated with recognized outbreaks. In our study, the number of laboratory-confirmed sporadic cases was 25 times greater than the number of raw milk-associated outbreak, outbreak cases. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Jay Russell. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Dr. Shaftel. Uh, that was an excellent overview of the risks and, and the vulnerable populations and a good lead in, into my discussion that will cover some of the policy and politics surrounding the raw milk movement. In other words, lessons in foodborne disease, cultural rebellion, and political theater. As Dr. Sheffield alluded to in Minnesota, we are seeing that despite public health warnings, the demand for raw or unpasteurized milk appears to be increasing. And advocates promote raw milk for its purported better taste and health benefits and as a way for consumers to support small dairies and local, ag local agriculture. I think it's really important for this audience of clinicians and veterinary preventive medicine practitioners to understand the profile and the background of people that are seeking out raw milk and rejecting our public health messages. So again, our traditional public health education messages about food safety and pasteurization are often ineffective for these consumers. And the activists often cite constitutional rights as an issue, as part of what is, is driving uh, their considerations. Author and blogger David Gumper has written that increasingly, quote, increasingly our access to privately available food is under attack by government and industry forces that seek to impose their choices on us. So I think to understand what's going on, it's good to look at uh, a little bit of a historical perspective. Uh, this is a slide of a uh, dairy uh, pro uh, progress timeline that uh, was borrowed by uh, Russ Courier. And kind of the key points here is that uh, we started to see commercial pasteurization in the late 1800s. 
And raw milk uh, was continuing to be distributed, and in the uh, early 1900s, there was actually certified raw milk that had oversight by the American Association of Medical Milk Commissioners. That ended in the late 1970s, and I'll talk a little bit about why. But now uh, raw milk regulation is a, is a patchwork of uh, of, uh, of laws at mostly the state levels. So in uh, in the early 1900s, when when pasteurization uh, was begun, raw milk was causing about one in four food and waterborne outbreaks. It was a major public health concern. And in 1924, the U.S. Public Health Service published the first standard milk ordinance for voluntary adoption by state and local milk control agencies. This is now called the Grade A Pasteurized Milk Ordinance, or PMO. And again, it voluntary uh, because the way that dairy, uh, the history of dairy regulation in the U.S. was to put that at the state and local level for their uh, agriculture, in their agriculture codes usually. Michigan was the first state to mandate pasteurization of milk. And this is a, a paper that, that I dug up. Uh, it was published in 1912 in JAMA. Uh, titled The Case for Pasteurization, and, and this is a quote, few practical sanitary questions have aroused so lively and even intense feeling as the pasteurization of milk. So that was over 100 years ago, and I shudder to think that uh, Dr. Sheffel and my presentation will still be going on in, in the next 100 years, but it's possible. So back to what happened with that milk commission and certified milk in the United States. It basically stopped after a, the Altadena or Stubies dairy went out of business following uh, a number of deaths uh, from Salmonella Dublin. And this, this uh, problem at this particular dairy overlapped with the AIDS HIV epidemic, and many of these were invasive salmonellosis cases. And ultimately, these illnesses uh, coming from this, this California dairy prompted a citizen's petition and a federal judge ruling that ordered the FDA to ban fluid, raw milk, and milk products from interstate commerce. So that's where the federal regulations do step in, and that relates to going over uh, state lines. And there is an exception, though, for cheeses made with raw milk that are aged for at least 60 days. So where are we at the state level in our 21st century raw milk regulations? There's quite a bit of variation, and Dr. Sheffield described the, the Minnesota model. Uh, these uh, Across the, the U.S., it ranges from legal, having licensed, inspected, uh, heavily regulated raw milk all the way to the retail level, which is what we have here in California, to basically no, no inspection, no oversight, what was described in uh, Minnesota, which is essentially like incidental sales right off the farm. There are states like Michigan uh, that uh, and Maryland that have complete, in Florida they have complete bans, um, and there's a lot of underground market in, in both of these scenarios of legal and illegal milk. Um, one of the scary one scenarios is actually uh, states like Florida where pet, raw milk can be sold as, as pet food and with a wink-wink, people go in and buy it uh, for human consumption. There's also the phenomenon of bathtub cheese. This is actually mostly within the Latino population, and I'm not going to go too much into that demographic, uh, but it's a, they, we do see quite a bit of illness, especially from uh, raw milk cheeses, uh, uh, soft cheeses like queso uh, fresco. But that is a different demographic than more of the uh, the population that the health conscious uh, uh, kind of foodie population that's getting into raw milk and probably driving the, the increased interest. There's also this situation of in between herd shares or cow shares. Um, if you haven't heard of these, it's basically a, a loophole where a, a boarding agreement is set up and, and the customer buys. Part of the cow, the farmer provides the milk, and it's usually uh, you pay ahead, like a community-supported agriculture. And there's actual contracts that have been put together by raw milk activists, lawyers. Um, and whether these are legal or not, it depends. Some have been challenged, and, and some of these dairies have actually been successfully sued following outbreaks. And I'm going to describe one situation where the state actually 
where uh, a jury trial actually uh, ruled in favor of the farmer having this herd shift. So the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, or NASDA, uh, will survey all of their uh, state veterinarians and ag departments. And uh, the last survey in 2011 showed that we have 20 states that completely prohibit the sale of raw milk and 30 states that have some version of legal sales. 13 states restrict legal sales to only the farm, like what was described on Minnesota. 12 states allow retail stores, like what we have in California. And five states have very compound regulations that limit the number of animals or the type of goats and cows that are kept. This next slide is a map from Real Raw Milk Facts. And this is a, a clickable map that you can go back and look at that has each of the state laws. So this modern-day raw milk movement, uh, the I think that uh, if you go and look at their website, what truly stands out, especially in light of what Dr. Sheffield presented, is that this movement is very focused on children and infants and promoting raw milk for its health benefits uh, for our most vulnerable population for foodborne pathogens. And that, to me, is at the heart of, of the problem because unlike other risky raw raw foods like raw oysters and, and raw sprouts, uh, the vulnerable population and, and the target population is children. So these values uh, that were alluded to, for the Weston A. Price Foundation, which is the largest organization promoting raw milk, uh, the, uh, they are telling uh, people that are interested and people are gravitating to this for these reasons. It can save family farms. Products contain no additives, that's meaning uh, no GMOs, no hormones, no antibiotics. Uh, the milk contains butter fat and lots of it. It's part of this idea of, of real food and, and the uh, paleo movement. Uh, the milk is not homogenized, not pasteurized, and comes from no cows that eat real feed. In other words, grass, grass-fed cows is a huge part of this movement. So back to the food rights. Interestingly, there was a very nice paper by Langer et al., uh, looking at CDC data, and, and they found that states that restrict the sale of non-pasteurized products had fewer outbreaks and illnesses and recommended stronger restrictions and enforcement be considered. Yet, in recent years, dozens of state bills have been being introduced by lawmakers to expand access or relax the regulation of raw milk. And on the federal level, uh, the libertarian movement, in particular Ron Paul, has been pushing for some time to overturn the interstate ban. His, his uh, quip is pasteurization without representation. This farmer in Wisconsin is an interesting legal case. He had been uh, illegal in Wisconsin. Uh, raw milk is illegal, just like Minnesota, only sales off the farm. He had been uh, 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 distributing uh, dairy products illegally, and he was taken to court in a jury trial, and they ruled, uh, and they uh, actually did found him not guilty. And when Wisconsin put forward a bill to, to come up with regulated infected raw milk, he actually opposed the bill because he said, I am allowed to do what I do without a license. That is uh, his, his right. So... This slide is actually comes from California, and it reflects some of the political theater that we've had out here. This was a bill actually put forward to relax uh, standards, in, in particular to remove testing uh, requirements for, for our retail raw milk. Um, it received hundreds of comments. Uh, people rallied at the Capitol. And the picture in the up, upper left-hand corner is actually Martin Sheen, who played a, a TV president at one time. He is actually a, a big raw milk proponent, and he's there with Dean Flores, who was the at the time the chair of the Health and Safety Committee uh, committee in the Senate. And he is a raw milk supporter and had put forward this, this bill to reduce testing of raw milk in California. It ultimately failed. Um, the uh, Governor Schwarzenegger at the time vetoed it. And if you go back last year, there were over 40 bills put forward, and really nothing has changed. In the end, they all failed in committee or were vetoed. But, but a tremendous amount of time is put, in, put into this uh, push uh, in all of these state bills. 
In terms of the media reaction, Dr. Sheftel uh, covered some of that. This is a, a picture of uh, the Colbert Report. This is a little uh, video that uh, they put together after a food raid in Southern California that was uh, selling uh, illegal raw milk that had been shipped out from an Amish farm in the Midwest and a very popular food club uh, down in Venice, California. And it's interesting with the media with these raids. In general, uh, the agriculture and public health people end up looking bad. Uh, the media just tends to favor the small farmers and uh, the, pe the people that are seeking out these natural, healthy foods versus the big industrial agriculture complex. And so uh, that's, I think, uh, you know, where we have challenges in communication to, to the media and lawmakers on, on why this really is a, a public health issue. And it is more than health and safety. We, we do, as communicators, have to think about these concerns about constitutional rights and informed choice and, and weighing these risks and benefits in our, in our discussion. So we clearly know the risks. This, this is a, uh, uh, from a Facebook page, uh, from a mother, Jill, who's, whose daughter had a very severe E. coli 0157 infection that led to stroke and HUS, and ultimately she is brain damaged and had a kidney transplant uh, earlier this year. Her mother donated the kidney. She had joined uh, one of these cow shares, and from a friend of hers that was running it down the road, only three cows, all grass-fed, and uh, this horrific outbreak actually affected four of the, ch the young children in, in the farm family as well as as well as uh, Kylie. So why would a mother have gone uh, to this length to get to get raw milk? Um, there are a lot of benefit claims uh, on the web, on the internet, and by word of mouth. Um, the biggest, of course, is taste, but more and more what, what parents are, are going for is purported better nutrition, reduced allergy, asthma, infections, relief from lactose intolerance, tooth decay, cancer prevention, autism treatment, the list goes on and on. And it's important to recognize that, that there, is, there is some epidemiologic evidence out of Europe uh, related to the asthma and allergy connection. Most of, of the list on that on the slide before were uh, anecdotal stories uh, and uh, really no evidence uh, toward these benefits. But there are some studies out of Europe that have shown an inverse relationship between uh, the consumption of raw milk and less uh, child during childhood and less allergies, asthma, and atrophy. And this sort of fits into that concept of the hygiene hypothesis. These these studies uh, out of Europe, uh, it's interesting, this New York Times article, one of the authors said, you know, here finally we have something concrete to take off the farm. But as you review that literature, none of the scientists are recommending that pe people consume raw milk or use it as a cure or prevention approach for, for childhood allergies because of the risk of pathogens. And, and really what the scientists are hoping is to identify what this component might be in the milk and extract it or preserve it. There was just a paper out in, in PLOS One uh, describing a study looking at the possibility that it may be intact bovine IgG that could actually be put back into uh, into infant formula and, and bypassing the, uh, the, the raw milk altogether. But, you know, the reality is with the values and the reasons that people are gravitating to raw milk, um, simply finding this component isn't going to, isn't going to stop people from seeking out this product. So we're, we're now, um, I work now at the university. Uh, I work with a lot of extension people and it's been on my mind for some time, this conundrum of, of do we just let the raw milk uh, producers and consumers try to figure it out this themselves, or should we be doing more research? Uh, what uh, you know, are there farm factors that, that could be affecting pathogen survival? Uh, is there a, um, improved diagnostic assays that could be done? The type of indicator tests that that are done by states where raw milk are legal um, go back, you know, 50 plus years. Do we have anything modern in our toolbox? to help detect pathogens or indicators, and 
I'm very fascinated with metagenomics, its ability to look at the biome of milk. And these claims that raw milk is a probiotic uh, substance um, are, are is very disputable. We've we've got some have some preliminary data looking at retail raw milk, um, and we did not find lactic acid bacteria or bifidobacter or probiotic bacteria. So I, I, it would be really nice to see some research in this area where, where we'd have data to refute some of those health claims that, that really are not evidence-based. And lastly, is there is there a place for a best practices approach? You know, we have other high-risk foods and scenarios like sprouts and petting zoos where we do put out recommendations for risk reduction. Is there a place for that? Is there a place for the E. coli 0157 cattle vaccines to help uh, uh, bring down the risk in these these uh, scenarios that, that we've been seeing with the outbreaks. And uh, that, for me, that, that is a, a bit of a question uh, in not wanting to appear to be promoting raw milk, but also not leaving these producers and consumers to go on the Internet and find a lot of misinformation. One uh, industry organization, the Raw Milk Institute, actually has had some veterinary input to put together voluntary standards um, but there's actually quite a bit of resistance to this among raw milk producers that are that feel that they they really don't need any kind of oversight, including by their own industry. So to finish up, I wanted to point you to the website that um, we put together after a session at, at the American Vet Medical Association uh, back in 2009. Uh, on this website, uh, we keep. Uh, 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 we try to keep up to date all of the position statements that are out there. There was recently one that came out from the Academy of uh, Pediatricians. Uh, we have a lot of uh, scientific references, that map that I showed, outbreak tables. <coughs> and, and what's um, unique on this site, oftentimes raw milk activists use testimonials and videos to, uh, to gain interest in raw milk. And we actually had people come to us, um, parents and, and people who had become ill from raw milk wanting to tell their stories. And all of them across the board went to raw milk for, for their belief in, in making their health better. Uh, this woman, uh, Mary Tarda from Northern California, she's actually a public health nurse, and uh, there was a lot of excitement in her small town about a local dairy, grass-fed dairy, um, that was putting together a cow share with the best of intentions, and unfortunately, they had a Campylobacter outbreak, and she developed Guillain-Barre syndrome and, and is uh, permanently paralyzed. She had a really rough, uh, rough road um, toward recovery, and and she was a public health nurse, and her husband was a veterinarian. So, it's um, there's just so much interest in in this lo in local farms and uh, going back to natural foods that that um, that that we're going to continue to see this, this gravitation toward raw milk. And I'm going to leave you with, with this quote um, from a protest that, that took place at, at the Capitol. Sally Fallon, the president and raw milk advocate of Weston A. Price, uh, told a, a newspaper, raw milk is a magic food, and we are here to defend that magic food. Sarah Klein, who's a, a lawyer with the Center for Science in, in the Public Interest, countered her quote saying, we have to remember this is just milk from a cow. It's not milk from a unicorn. So with that, that concludes my presentation, and I'll turn it back to Loretta for the, the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Shefto and Dr. J. Russell. We will now open up the line for the question and answer session. You may submit a question using the webinar system by clicking on the Q&A tab located at the top of the webinar toolbar and then typing in your question. To ask a question on the phone, please press star 6 to unmute your line, state your name, and then ask your question. So while we are waiting for the first question for the participants, so, Dr. J. Russell and Dr. Shefko, can you comment on the debate related to the argument that less pathogens are found in grass-fed cows and other livestock? You go ahead, Dr. J. Russell. Okay. Yeah, I can I can uh, answer that one. And on our on our Real Raw Real Milk Facts website, we do have a table of grass-fed uh, outbreaks. 
uh, from raw milk. But, um, yeah, there is some evidence in, in, in that uh, lower stacking density uh, is associated with uh, lower prevalence of, of E. coli 0157 and uh, other uh, steps. And uh, the uh, versus having um, uh, a concentrated animal feeding operation. But what we see is we still see E. coli 0157 and, and uh, Campylobacter in these in these grass-fed animals. And it's probably the number one myth that that people get uh, believe in terms of uh, uh, on-farm prevention. And uh, we have done quite a bit to try to uh, to counter counter that uh, misbelief. Okay, thank you. Let's see if we have any questions on the phone. Callers, do you have a question for our pre presenters today? Okay, looks like we got a couple of questions in the webinar system. Let's see, somebody wants a copy of the slides in the audio portion. And that information, you can contact the college to get the archive of this recording and also slides, and that is at the acvpm.org site. And let's see, we have another question here. Do veterinarians have any legal reporting responsibility when asking, when, excuse me, when asked to provide services to a family that may be distributing raw milk? No. <laughs> um, no, I'd add, I'd add too that in fact that's an opportunity of you know to educate that family about the risks and about hygiene and uh, dairy practices. Okay. Very good. Uh, anyone on the phone? Again, press star six to unmute your phone line if you would like to ask a question. Okay, so I have additional question for discussion. So you talked a lot about the Minnesota study. Um, so how can you be sure that raw milk uh, is the cause of the sporadic illnesses in the Minnesota study? Loretta, that is a very good question. It, you know, just by the definition of what a sporadic case is, that those are the cases that are not associated with an outbreak. So by definition, we cannot definitively link the illness in the case to raw milk. Um, but, and, and also I will say that it is true that 50% of our raw milk cases also reported contact with cattle during their exposure period. However, 50% did not. Also, each case history was examined, and if there was a more likely source of infection than raw milk consumption, that case was excluded. For example, a two-year-old that fell into a cow pie three days prior to illness onset but also drank raw milk was not included in the study. But the strongest evidence for the association of our case's illness with raw milk consumption is the very low 0.7% background level of raw milk consumption reported among those case patients with infections that were not associated with raw milk or other cattle exposures, and that compares to 3.7% among our case patients with infections commonly associated with raw milk. So yes, the answer is we can never be sure, but all, um, all um, studies like this um, have that same bias, but we did everything we could to limit it. Okay, so thank you for that um, detailed response. And so while we're talking about raw milk, so you talked about some of the other products that are made with milk. So how is that 60-day aging period determined for legal cheeses made with raw milk? Where would you get that number from? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, the uh, Basically, the FDA did a, a risk assessment early on, and uh, based on survival pathogen uh, survival studies in cheeses. Uh, some of these studies came out of Europe uh, where, where raw milk cheeses are very popular and, and some out of the U.S. Uh, 60 days was somewhat arbitrarily picked and that is actually under uh, scrutiny uh, right now and FDA should be coming out any time with uh, 
possible modifications of the 60-day aging process. And I don't know what those will look like, but we have in the last few years had some pretty serious uh, outbreaks from uh, legal age cheese. So there, there are some questions of, of where that's going to go, but there is quite a bit of pushback by the American Cheese Society and, uh, and raw milk artisan cheese enthusiasts uh, to not uh, completely ban those popular cheeses. They, those cheeses also, they, they really are lower risk um, than fluid raw milk. That that evidence is pretty clear in the literature, but, but they're higher risk than, than most uh, pasteurized cheese products. Cheese products. Okay. Thank you for that response. So we're going to go again to the phone and see if we have any participants who would like to pose a question to our presenters today. Again, let's take a moment and press star six if to unmute your phone if you would like to ask our presenter a question. Okay, hearing no further questions, I would uh, like to thank today's presenter. So on behalf of COCA, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today with a special thank you to our presenters, Dr. Shefto and Dr. J. Russo. Free continued Continuing education is available for this webinar. Those who participated in today's COCA conference call and would like to receive continuing education credit should complete the online evaluation by December 18th of 2014. If you are going to listen to this as an archive on demand presentation, you will have up to a year to earn continuing education and you must complete that by November 18th. 2015. Again, this will be archived to the college webpage, not to our COCA webpage. And if you're interested in receiving information on upcoming COCA calls, you can subscribe to COCA by sending us an email to COCA at cdc.gov and write subscribe in the subject line. Our next COCA ACVPM Joint Partner Webinar will be on Tuesday, December 9th. The title is Public Health Policy, Origin and Formulation. During this call, participants will learn about policy formulation processes at the federal, state, and local levels and hear suggestions on how veterinary practitioners can improve policy outcomes. CDC launched a Facebook page for health partners like our page at facebook.com slash CDC Health Partners Outreach to receive COCA updates. We appreciate you taking part in today's COCA webinar. Thank you again for being a part and have a great day. You may now disconnect your phone line at this time. This concludes today's presentation.